This video looks at what the Christoffel symbols mean in some given space as well as how they can be calculated by the use of one of two methods it outlines. It uses the example of transforming from Cartesian to polar coordinates to show how basis vectors change from point to point in a given space. So let's begin by transforming from Cartesian to polar coordinates. So we have Cartesian, we transform to polar coordinates, we'll label our coordinates x1, x2, um, and x is given by rho cos phi, and y is rho sine phi. The position vector in Cartesian space is given by this object, and substituting in polar coordinates, we get this object. Now the basis vectors in the polar coordinate system are given by this partial derivative, so this object here in the row direction, the basis vector in the row direction, is given by this partial derivative, which is a partial derivative of the position vector with respect to rho. That's this object here. And E phi in the phi direction, in the angular direction, is the partial derivative of the position vector r with respect to the coordinate phi. All right. Just a reminder of Cartesian basis vectors in the x direction, in the y direction, fixed unit length, orthogonal to each other, and that's in other words, wherever you go on the two-dimensional plane there in Euclidean space, Cartesian space, you have your basis vectors of unit magnitude, Bx, By, in the x direction and the y direction. Now the basis vectors in polar coordinate space are given by E rho as dr d rho, is dd rho of this object, the position vector, and that gives us, when we differentiate through, use a partial root of, with respect to rho, we end up with cos phi Ex plus sine phi Ey. And then the basis vector in the phi direction, E phi, is dr d phi, d d phi, the position vector again. And we end up with minus rho sine phi Ex plus rho cos phi Ey. These have magnitudes, modulus of the basis vector in the rho direction is this object here. And that gives us this, which is 1, so the magnitude of that basis vector is 1, its length is 1. In the phi direction, we have this object here, e phi dot e phi, gives us this object here, whose magnitude is rho. Alright, basis vectors in the polar coordinate system. Okay, as you can see here, e phi, e phi, e rho, as we go up, each going up by one unit, they they are a fixed magnitude of unit length, all of them, so everywhere you see E rho will be of one unit, but E phi will change, because E phi depends on rho, as rho increases as you move further out from the origin, from the pole, uh, this increases in length, its magnitude increases, because it's a function of rho. Next one, we can use the basis vectors in some given coordinate system to determine the Christoffel symbols of the second kind. So that's with one index raised, that's Christoffel, the second, uh, is Christoffel symbol of the second kind, one upper index, two lower indices. And that is equal to the partial group of the basis vector with respect to each of the coordinates in turn, and that's equal to this object here. Notice there's one index up, C up top, and C below, which means that we sum across C and C takes on all the values we have, for given how many coordinates we have for that space. These Christoffel symbols tell us how much the basis vectors change from point to point in the space under consideration. We'll see more of that. Now in flat space, these symbols are all equal to zero, as the basis vectors are constant from point to point. Remember the Cartesian basis vectors here, uh, these are fixed, they're constant unit length, and the partial derivative of them will obviously be zero, so there's no Christoffel symbols of the second kind, they're all zero in this case. So in flat space, we don't have Christoffel symbols because they're all zero. In curved space, the basis vectors change from point to point and the Christoffel symbols are non-zero, so the partial derivative of the basis vectors with respect to each of the coordinates does, is not equal to zero, and the Christoffel symbols have non-zero values. Now if you have a look at this surface here, let's pretend this is our manifold, space that we're interested in at the point A, basis vector here, point B, basis vector here, point C, basis vector here, they change from point to point. They're not fixed as in Euclidean flat space. So in curved space they vary from point to point and hence these Christoffel symbols of the second kind are non-zero. Alright, finding Christoffel symbols, the first method, let's take the partial derivative of the basis vector in the row direction with respect to phi, we get dd phi, 
of e rho, which is the subject here. And when we differentiate that, we expect to phi, we get minus sine phi ex plus cos phi ey. And we notice that this is simply 1 on rho of e phi. So if you compare e phi from the previous, uh, one of the earlier slides, you'll see that if you multiply by 1 over rho, you get this object here. Now, the e, uh, the partial derivative of the basis vector in the rho direction with respect to phi is 1 on rho e phi, and de rho d phi is this Christoffel symbol, phi, uh, the rho and the phi here, following the rule on the previous page, rho phi, expanding in terms of phi, because we have phi here. So that means that this object must be equal to this object, which means that we can equate the coefficients of e phi, the basis vector e phi, e phi, that Christoffel symbol of the second kind must be equal to 1 on rho. So this Christoffel symbol of the second kind is 1 on rho. And what we do is we find the partial derivative of the basis vector, and whichever one you're dealing with, with respect to one of the coordinates, and we find that it's 1 on rho times e phi. And so that partial derivative is also equal to this relation here, as we saw on the previous page, and so this 1 on rho must be equal to this Christoffel symbol. And so we end up with this. So there's our first Christoffel symbol. The next one is de rho d rho. Well, d d rho of e rho is zero. So d e rho d rho is equal to this Christoffel symbol times the basis vector here. We, we sum across c, and that implies that uh, this Christoffel symbol, rho here, rho here, so they go down the bottom here, and then c, c, we're summing across all possibilities. There's only two here. C can be rho or C can be phi, but in all cases they're going to be zero because this whole object is zero, so that means all the Christoffel symbols must be zero because the basis vectors are not zero, and so the only way this whole thing can go to zero is if the Christoffel symbols, all of them, are zero. So this Christoffel symbol is zero for all values of C. Let's move on. D E phi D rho is D D rho of this object. And when we take the partial derivative of that, we end up with minus sine phi EX plus cos phi EY. And that gives us 1 over rho e phi. Now, we're saying that the partial derivative of the basis vector in the phi direction with respect to rho is 1 on rho e phi. And that's equal to this relation here, as we saw earlier, because that's the definition of the um, partial derivative of the basis vector. is equal to the Christoffel symbol times the basis vector. And so that implies that this Christoffel symbol must be equal to 1 on rho. So there's our second Christoffel symbol in this case. d e phi d phi gives us d d phi of this object here, which is e phi. And when we differentiate that, we end up with minus rho cos phi e x minus rho sine phi e y, which is equal to minus rho e rho. And so the partial derivative of e phi, the basis vector in the phi direction with respect to phi, is minus rho times e phi. And that's equal to that Christoffel symbol times the basis vector here. And that means we must have this Christoffel symbol of the second kind is equal to minus rho. So the four Christoffel symbols for our polar coordinate system are these four here. All right, and that's for all values of C. And so let's move on. Now, the second method we could have used is here's the formula for the Christoffel symbol of the second kind, the general formula. And now what we must do is substitute for each of these indices one at a time and systematically search through them. But before I do that, well, I need the metric, which is now the metric is found using the basis vectors. So G uh, contravariant, uh, covariant AB, two indices lower. So this is the metric, it's the basis vector dotted itself. And GOV gives us this here. And these basis vectors dotted together give us these objects here. G subscript row row. This one here. G subscript row phi. G phi row. G phi phi. And that's how we get the basis vector. That's how we get these terms in the metric. And the metric can then be used up here. So next step. Calculate basis vector. E row dotted with E row is this dotted with this. Gives us 1. E rho dot E phi is this dotted with that gives us zero. E phi E rho by symmetry, that'll give us zero as well. E phi dotted with E phi will give us this object here, 
which is row squared. And then the metric for this particular, for polar coordinates here in two dimensions is one, zero, zero row squared. Now the inverse metric, when you have a diagonal metric, the inverse is easy because it's simply the reciprocal of each of these terms along the diagonal, each of these elements along the diagonal here. So the inverse metric, that's with both indices raised, is this object, which is just 1 over these, which is 1 and 1 over rho squared. So we have the metric and we have the inverse metric. There's the metric and there's the inverse metric. Now, let's begin. Here's our formula again for the Christopherson of the second kind. Let's start with mu equals rho. Now, if mu is rho, over here where mu is, we've got to put rho. Now, the only non-zero uh, term in the inverse metric, if mu is rho, then lambda must be rho as well, because that was the only non-zero term. So, for, so we have g rho rho. Okay, so we go through all this. Gamma mu alpha beta is gamma rho alpha beta is a half g rho rho. And where the mu and the lambda are, we're going to place a rho for both. When we do that, we come out with this object here. All right. Now, to go any further, what we do is we try now, the next search is pick one of these, alpha or beta, we'll pick alpha, and we'll set that equal to rho. Because the only g rho something is g rho rho, that's in the metric. g rho rho is 1. So let's pick rho for alpha, so we go through and we do all that. And so we've got this object, this object here. Now the only thing that's unknown is the beta. Again, the only non-zero g rho something is g rho rho is 1, so beta equals rho as well. So when we put that in, we get gamma rho up the top and rho rho down the bottom, which gives us this object here times this. Now, these cancel out and we're left with just a half g rho row contravariant, both indices, times this object here. Now, and when we work our way through that, g rho rho from the inverse metric is 1, and g rho rho from the metric, lower indices here, is 1 as well, and you have a partial group in front, so this all goes to 0. So this Christoffel symbol we found is 0, just by searching through the indices on the definition of the Christoffel symbol of the second kind using the metrics. Metric. All right, next one. Let's try, here's our formula again. Let's try mu is phi. So I'll put phi up there, which means phi there. Again, the only non-zero term in the inverse metric, if you've got a phi here, has to be a phi there as well. So where mu and our, our lambda are, we're going to put phi. So we do that. There we go. Next thing we'll try, let's try, you try each of the indices systematically, but let's try phi, alpha is phi. Um, and so we'll put that in because the only non-zero g phi something is g phi phi, which is rho squared. So through we go. Put that in. The only thing left unknown now is the beta. All right, now for beta, we'll try phi. Because again, if you have a look here, uh, g phi, uh, anything other, if we put a rho here, it'll be zero. Um, so let's try something. Let's try phi in there. And we get all phi's. One up top and two below gives us this object here. So those two will cancel out. And we're left with just this part here at the front times this object here. So it's that written there. And that'll be one half times now g phi phi upper indices was one on row squared times d d phi. Because x phi just means the phi coordinate. And g lower phi phi, it's two covariant indices, is row squared. And the partial group of a row squared with respect to phi will just be zero, so this Christopher symbol will also be zero. Now, the beta equals rho, we'll try beta equals rho from the previous page. It gives this object here. Okay, now some things will cancel out there. For instance, those two will cancel out, and we're left with a half g phi phi d g phi phi lower dx rho, which is just a row coordinate, so it's a half, one on row squared, if you remember the previous page, times d d rho, times of rho squared, well, that'll differentiate, that'll work out, and when you perform that differentiate, you get two rho, so the two will cancel with this half here, and you'll get rho over one over rho squared, so you get one on rho, and by symmetry we have gamma phi 
phi rho is 1 on rho is equal to gamma phi rho phi. So those two Christoffel symbols are now being determined. And so we have again the four, the only four Christoffel symbols for this coordinate system. Here we are. There we go. I'll say four there. And just one more thing, Christoffel symbols of the first kind can be found uh, using this expression here. The metric can lower this upper index, the other mu there and the mu there, they sum out. So they lower the index and end up with gamma, alpha, beta, gamma, with all the um, indices lowered. So that's how we calculate Christoffel symbols, a simple example.